and a very warm welcome. I know most of you, and my name is Zach, uh, Zachariah Ali, and I'm an MPP student here at the school. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to be joined in conversation with two very distinguished guests and friends of the school. And as many of you know, we held a technology and public policy conference here a couple of weeks ago. And there we looked at uh, two things. We looked at how governments can best utilize technology as a tool for governance, good governance. And the second question we looked at, and we will come back to tonight, was should technology be regulated and who should be doing it and to which extent should governments get involved? So tonight's conversation is about norms to promote stability and avoid conflict in cyberspace. So hopefully by the end of this evening, we'll have a better idea of what that sentence actually means. Um, and joining me is Fadi Shahadi, who is an information technology executive the founder of RosettaNet and a former CEO of ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and he'll tell you exactly what they do. He's currently a partner at um, Abri Partners, and he's also a senior advisor to the chairman of the World Economic Forum. His focus has been partnerships and diplomacy to build trust in the digital world. And he will tell you about um, multi-stakeholder governance for networks and such like. And next to me here, we have Professor Joe Nye, who needs little introduction. And in fact, he said, keep the introductions minimal. Um, but I won't. And um, <laughs> he is a visiting professor at the Blavatnik School of Government. He's a Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor and a former dean of the Harvard Kennedy School from 95 to 2004. He's served on the, the Carter administration and the Clinton administration as Chair of National Intelligence Council, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, and Deputy Under Secretary of State. He's consistently ranked one of the most influential scholars on American foreign policy, and we're very excited to hear him talk about cybersecurity tonight. So, a warm welcome to you both. Um, and first of all, if, if I start with you, Fadi, if you could really tell us a bit about your work that you've done uh, previously with ICANN, and also the cyberspace. So if we start with that, first of all. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Let me start by saying that cyberspace as a distinct space, in my opinion, is dead. It's gone. There's no such thing. All space is now cyber. Everything. We spent the day here talking about you know, governments doing digital things. There's no such thing. Everything governments do is now touched by the digital and cyber world. Uh, we live in the technology space, and therefore, it's very important for me, if I could, to start by describing that space, by making sure we're all at least on the same page as to how uh, the layers of cyberspace are set up and who governs them. So I'm going to use a very simple analogy. I'm going to use this table that many of you may not see. A typical table has some legs, and then there is the tabletop, and there are things on the table. I'm going to use that as an analogy to describe cyberspace or all space. The legs are the networks in the digital space. Today, there are approximately 76,000 legs in that space. There are 76,000 networks that enable the Internet as we know it. Who owns these networks? British Telecom, AT&T, China Telecom, who, all these companies own those networks. Who governs those networks? Who decides how these networks are run? Uh, well, it's uh, government ministries of telecommunication. The standards are written by the IEEE, by ITU, by all these bodies. This space, this part of the digital space, is well-governed. Well-governed. It's good enough. It works. Now, connected to these 76,000 legs are today approximately 30 billion things. Estimates by some people, Stanford and Fairchild, say that by 2030, we will go from 30 billion to, they say, I think it's a bit much, 100 trillion Let's say they're off by 100 trillion things. Lots of things will be connected, including potentially my heart valve, 
my brain, my eyes, things around us, everything will be talking to the network. So that's this layer. Now, how do all these 76,000 networks and the billions of things connected to them get to be called the internet or the digital space? It's because of the tabletop, this thin layer on top of all of these things that makes the internet look like one internet. There is no such thing as one internet. But we can all address the billions of things and the networks in one way because there is something called the logical infrastructure of the internet. That's the unique names and numbers that allow us to talk to everything connected. That is governed by ICANN. That's the institution that I ran for four years. ICANN used to be, in some way, part of the US Defense Department. And President Clinton pushed it out as an independent organization. And when I came to run it in 2012, it governed all this tabletop. It made sure that every part of cyberspace was addressable in the same way. That's why whenever you type www.ibm.com from your phone, from your computer, from South Africa, or from Cairo, you always connect to the machine that IBM made, ibm.com. And it never fails, by the way. It's never failed. That's because of this layer. Until September 30th, 2016, that layer, governed by ICANN, was in effect controlled by the US government. President Obama, at midnight, let that go. And as of that moment, that layer became truly independent of any one government's control. That was part of the project that I ran at ICANN to make it essentially independent of a single government's control. And China, Brazil, India, many major countries then agreed to keep the internet as one internet because there was a plan to actually create another tabletop and create a completely separate internet. Now, which brings me to the last part, which is everything on the table. Cups, glasses, phones, whatever. What are these things? Well, these are all the things that use that layer beneath. So many people call the tabletop and the legs underneath the internet. On top of that, we now have what? We have email. That's an application on the internet. There is the web. The World Wide Web is not the internet. It's an application on the internet. There is Facebook. There is everything else. There's the million cameras that are sitting and collecting data and doing artificial intelligence decisions on that. So that layer at the top, I finally will ask you, who governs that layer? So we agreed who governs the legs. We agreed who governs that tabletop. Who governs what happens above the table? And I think that's the subject of this panel. Not only who governs it, but who should govern it? And how should we govern it? And I'll give you two samples of questions to address this. One, if an autonomous car is about to hit a lady with a baby, or an old gentleman crossing the street, or uh, a family of people, and now that autonomous car not only uh, is able to quickly decide which one to hit first, but it's connected to the ERP system that tells it uh, uh, the current uh, bank accounts of these people it's about to hit, the current health profile of the people it's about to hit. It has all kinds of information about the people it's about to hit. And in a split second decides, based on an algorithm, it's going to hit this person. OK? Who, who designed that algorithm? What should that algorithm do? That's an example of an issue above the table that today, as humanity, we have no agreement how to make those decisions. Should Tesla's engineers make that algorithm? Should a government agency do the algorithm? Should we all do it together? How, how do we do that? And another completely separate example, but a relevant one, uh, data, especially uh, I live in Los Angeles in the United States, is heavily collected. I mean, there are definitely companies that know uh, what my iWatch is collecting as data, uh, what I bought at my supermarket for the last month, uh, 
what my doctor said when I met him last, and they correlate all that data. And maybe at the end of that, they decide, hmm, Fadi's lifespan is only four more years. Who, who owns that piece of data now? I don't know. I asked someone at IBM Watson. I said, well, if Watson decides that, does, does IBM own that piece of data? He couldn't answer me. OK, would IBM share it with my wife without telling me, with my insurance company without telling me? with my employer without telling me, and there are no answers to all of this. So these are just two examples of the plethora of issues. Uh, my, 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 my mentor, my, my, in many ways my teacher, Joe, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm honored to be sitting next to him. Joe would talk to you about some of the bigger issues related to data weaponization and, and warfare, and who's going to decide those things. So I'll stop here. I hope this will at least open the discussion about what we're trying to decide together. Well, I, that's perfect, because what I want to do is pick up where Fadi left off, which is all these various apps. This is an app. <laughs> all these various, I can throw it at you and hit you and hurt you. Point is that all these apps or all this system can be used in international relations for conflict purposes, as well as cooperation. And uh, the question is, will we develop norms among states to limit how we do that? Uh, and right now, uh, there is a grave need for norms. It, it, the, the whole issue of cybersecurity, in other words, how, these, uh, how this interdependence, as Fadi put it, uh, correctly, it has become, the, the, the internet has become the substrate of everything. I mean, economics, politics, sociology, whatever. And that really is relatively new. In other words, people say, oh, the internet's been around since 70s or something. But the dependence on, the, on this system for so much of our uh, daily life, and economics, and so forth, is really only about 20 years old. If you look at a, at a picture of it, connections, it's like a hockey curve in the chart, which goes up in the about 98 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the, as Fadi said, with the Internet of Things, it's just going gonna, gonna to be off any chart you draw. So the question is, uh, how, how are we doing on the development of norms? One way to think of it is that international norms to govern new technologies take some time. The technology is very volatile, develops very quickly. Uh, human habits, laws, norms, political attitudes develop much more slowly. So if we use the analogy of nuclear weapons, which was a radical new technology in 1945, uh, and you ask, how long did it take before we got the first agreements among states? It's about 20 years. The Limited Test Ban Treaty, which was really an environmental agreement more than a, uh, a weapons agreement, uh, comes in 1963. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, comes in 68. The first treaty between the U.S. and the Soviets not to damage each other or to limit the damage through the so-called SALT Treaty, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, is 72. Uh, uh, you're, you're basically in the Internet world. We're at about where the, the states became in the nuclear world in terms of just chronology. But we also have a much more volatile and rapidly evolving technology. Uh, I've just written a paper uh, uh, called uh, The Development of Norms uh, to, uh, for Conflict Prevention in Cyberspace, and, uh, which is in the, a journal called uh, uh, Cyber Security, a, a, a peer review journal. And uh, the question that I ask there is why do states sometimes agree to norms that restrain their behavior? in a world of sovereign states, you know, why isn't it pure Hobbesianism? And the, one of the interesting things there is one reason that states 
do this is uh, for coordination problems. And that's, that's the very important organization that Fadi ran, ICANN. Without the domain name system and ICANN, the, the, you know, this would be chaos. Um, but that's kind of the easy part. It's not easy. He, it he worked very hard on it. But it coordination problems um, don't give you the full answer to why states refrain from turning off each other's grids or interfering in each other's elections and other such things. And there, what I've done in this paper is ask, what are the other reasons that states sometimes restrain themselves? And one reason is prudence and unknown consequences. And if you, and I use as an example here, not merely the development of the nuclear taboo, but, but if you look at privateering, which was so common it was written into the U.S. Constitution. But after time, in the eight, uh, late 18th and early 19th century, states realized that they couldn't control these people, that they was too dangerous. And by the middle of the century, you got a treaty in Paris which outlawed privateering. In the cyber world, we're facing that with so-called hackback. You know, there's way, and how are we going to deal with norms related to that? A second reason why states will restrain themselves or develop norms that might restrain themselves is uh, reputational. Uh, that if they, they do certain things, it is so outrageous that it affects their soft power. And the example I give there is chemical and biological weaponry, where there was a widespread revulsion after World War I, but it really took until the 70s before you had a treaty on biological warfare. It doesn't mean that everybody behaves perfectly when the treaty exists to witness uh, Assad's use of, of chemical weapons or against his own people, but nonetheless, it makes it much more difficult, as you saw with the international reaction to Syrian chemical weapons, and the fact that with biological weapons, the mere possession of them uh, is ipso facto seen as violating this norm. And the third reason that states will sometimes restrain themselves is, uh, by norms is uh, uh, what I call internalization. And this is particularly for democracies, that a, a, a social attitude or a norm will develop to the point where governments are constrained by public opinion on it. Mm. And there I use the example of slavery where William Wilberforce was a lonely figure in the British Parliament at the end of the 18th century. But uh, by 1807, uh, Britain outlawed the ocean slave trade. Mm. Uh, slavery isn't outlawed by all states until Brazil does in 1888. But one of the most intriguing cases is that in the 1860s, uh, the British government was trying to decide whether to recognize the American Confederacy, the South. And from a realpolitik point of view, uh, if you just looked at it, you'd say the best thing that Britain could do about this rising power of the United States is split it. And if when the South Wayne went to London and said, recognize us, there were many British cabinet ministers who said, of course, that's what we should do. But the norm of anti-slavery had taken such deep roots in British politics that the government was constrained by the internalization of this norm. And that included mill workers in Manchester who were dependent on cotton from the South. But their attitudes towards slavery were now fully internalized. And that was a very effective norm. So the questions I think we have to ask ourselves now is, it's going to take time, these develop, this development of international norms. But uh, uh, could we imagine these different forces, prudence, uh, external reputation, and internalization uh, uh, in domestic politics, creating a set of norms which will deal with some of these dangerous apps on top of Fadi's table? Why don't I stop there? No, that's very good. Which brings me back, Fadi, to. Um, who should be included in um, coming up with these norms? So there's a place for governments, and we'll talk about the global picture in a second. But 
what's the place for people in the Silicon Valley and the private sector in thinking about norms? I think, and this, we're, we spent the whole day struggling with, with many of these questions here today at Blavatnik. Look, it's only going to work when it's the citizen, us, each of us, that actually is in charge. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say this, and sadly, because, I mean, next to me are people, many people who want to believe that there is government to help us uh, in this situation. But the reality is, uh, right now, uh, we have a power struggle between companies, businesses, and governments, and we're getting lost in the middle. The reality is, if I ask you a very blunt question, uh, would you rather trust Google or the US government with your personal data? Raise your hands if you trust Google. Pick one. You have to pick one. Okay. Less okay. than half. And, and the rest of you presume, raise your hands, you, tr you would trust the U.S. government over Google. Interesting. Okay, so it's about 50-50, should it's we say? A, yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. This is, a, this is a question that we all need to be asking ourselves. And the way I would answer this question is, I need to figure out a way, frankly, to take control of my data. All of us need to think through that. I hate the term data privacy because, frankly, it is a very Occidental or Western term. If you go to somebody in Rwanda or in Cairo, where I come from, and say data privacy, they won't even know what you're talking about. It's a concept that is foreign to them. And I think we should all move away from that and start thinking of data ownership. Who owns your data? Ask yourself. Who should own your data? That will answer your question of who should set the norms. Mm. And I think if you ask this question to Joe or to anyone who really spent time studying this, I think the answer should be, I should be in control of my data. I should decide how much of it I give my government to give me services, how much of it to give Google to get services. And that means data needs to start being viewed as a valuable asset. It isn't today. Have you seen any company on their balance sheet say, this is the value of my data? When Facebook takes your data and sells ads, do they tell you the value of your data? Of course not. But in fact, they took value from you, and they traded it, and they got a lot of money. You got none of it. Maybe, maybe you should give it to them if they're willing to give you back money so you can buy pasta. But it's your data. And they're trading on it while you're sitting. OK, maybe they say it's a fair exchange for you to have our platform, which we built for you. Is it? I don't know. So I think data needs to start being viewed as the asset of the 21st century. And who uses it, who owns it, needs to be debated. The role of governments, so I don't evade your question, is critical. Here's the continuum. You have a government like China that basically says, all your data is mine. I'm not critiquing it. This is what it is. They, they, and at least, in fairness to them, they're very transparent about it. They tell you, your data is mine. I will watch you. I'll have all these cameras watching you. And I will correlate all of that. And I'll have a profile on you. And you know, that's how you get service and how that's you function in my society. Then you have on the other end a little teeny country, as we were reminded many times today, called Estonia, where from the beginning the government said, you own your data. And then you give us what you need so we can serve you. Now, that's the continuum. So the answer to you, Zach, is where is the model between these? Because clearly, I mean, Estonia, unfortunately, is too small. And unless we break up our states and, you know, Birmingham is a country and they can decide. Because Estonia is about the size of Birmingham, I learned today. But when you have big countries, 
neither model, well, one model has to prevail or something in between. I don't know yet what it is. We need to figure that out. Let me, let me just follow what Fadi said, because it, it, it's right on top, uh, it follows right from what he said. What do you do when another government weaponizes that data? Fadi addressed the question of what do we do about the internal model in which we've developed these companies based on advertising is they say if you're getting it for free, you're uh, basically the product, not the consumer. In other words, you're, it, that is one area. But suppose another government then weaponizes that system to attack you, and that's what Russia did in 2016. So to give you a concrete example, uh, there were two groups that met in Houston, Texas, to battle over Sharia law and whether it should be made in, or to dominate in the United States. Both of those groups were formed in, from St. Petersburg. And they, were, they, were, faced, they used Facebook to form a Muslim group, which was promoting Sharia, and an anti-Muslim group, which was fighting them. And they were told to meet at a certain street, a certain location. Uh, and all of this came from St. Petersburg, the IRA, the, the other IRA, the Internet Research Association, as they called it. Now, what should happen there when the data is being used as a weapon? Uh, should the government take it down? Should What about the free speech elements? In the U.S., the First Amendment means the government is a bit reluctant to, to do this. What's interesting and paradoxical is in the United States Constitution, a private company or a private university like Harvard is not bound by the First Amendment. So Google or Facebook can take down those messages from St. Petersburg uh, even though they're not sure whether it's from St. Petersburg, they can take it down because it violates our private terms of agreement. So all those terms of agreement that we all hate, that, you know, that go on and on and on, but it allows the private association to actually combat the weaponization of data more effectively than the government. And it wouldn't be as much of a problem in Britain where you don't have a First Amendment. But it's interesting because if you're going to ask, how do I deal with this as an interstate conflict? One possibility is I could imagine negotiating with the Russians uh, an arms control treaty. It's not very likely because their elections don't mean much and they have no First Amendment. Uh, so you have to rely in a case like this for norms being developed in the private sector. So even if, even if we don't like the advertising model as the progenitor of this system, uh, once you've got two billion people on Facebook, you're stuck with the fact that unless Facebook develops uh, publicly responsible ways in a democracy to deal with this, we're not going to be able to do as good a job defending ourselves when another government weaponizes information. But you can say this, Joe, because you're in the U.S. and you say, because I'm, I'm agreeing with you that unless those companies take responsibility for their platforms, we have a problem. Right. Yeah. But if I'm living in the U.K. or in Lebanon or in whatever, some other country, you know, I'm relying on an American company mm. that now has a transnational platform that touches me and my family and everybody I know to do the right thing. And you know, you and I spent quite a bit of time in Silicon Valley and we talked to these leaders. And I, I, I'm sorry to, to be blunt here, but I have yet to meet one of them. I mean, the, the one who just resigned from Facebook yesterday, I, you, know, you, you know him and I, we've talked to him many times. Uh, they're not ready. Yep. They're just not ready to take the responsibility of their platforms. Uh, and they admit it. They say, we're just, I mean, you saw Facebook CEO speak, and oftentimes you look at him and you almost feel sorry for him. And you kept saying, I don't know. You know, they, they really are not ready for the immense responsibility they have. 
of managing the most important asset of the 21st century, which is data. Yep. I agree. So before we um, come back to how we empower citizens and so that they can take charge or take back control of their data, in a sense, I want to come back to the role of government. So in 2016, we saw Obama expel Russian diplomats and companies following an interference with the US elections. So that was one way, and there's a question as to whether Trump will go that way. Um, but we've also seen um, China and the US coming to an agreement and having bilateral um, agreements forming, forming on the subject of espionage. And that was because the US complained for years that actually um, the Chinese were stealing from American companies. So which way should things be resolved in that sense? Well, it's interesting. The, 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 when people talk about deterrence in cyberspace, they often talk about a, a cyber Pearl Harbor. You know, somebody's going to shut down the grid and we're all going to freeze in the dark. Um, and there's, I mean, the U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, has used the term. It's, it's, it's uh, common. In fact, what's interesting that at the level of the equivalent of major kinetic warfare, bombing, to put it bluntly, there really hasn't been anything done. Michael Solmeyer, who used to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber, a colleague at Harvard, he says, let's face it, nobody has died because of a cyber capability. Uh, but if you, and if you look at the various norms, the UN Charter and the laws of armed conflict are applied in cyberspace. That plus prudence means that there haven't been big cyber wars. But if you go just below that into the gray zone of conflict, which is not the equivalent of kinetic conflict, bombs, uh, there's nothing governing there. And that's where the examples you gave come up. With the Russians, we thought that the agreements in the UNGGE, the Group of Government Experts, in which states agreed not to target civilian infrastructure might restrain them. It hasn't. Uh, but with China, uh, so there's a gray zone area where the conflict goes on. And frankly, the American sanctions against Russia on this have been uh, too weak or pusillanimous to be effective. But with China, uh, which had resisted for years the argument that the US made that stealing intellectual property by using cyber means was distorting the trade system. Um, uh, the Chinese had rejected this, but after the US uh, threatened major sanctions, and in the summer of 2015, uh, Obama told Xi Jinping that the summit that was scheduled would be disrupted or yeah. destroyed, um, the Chinese did a reversal, and they signed an agreement in September of 2015 saying neither the U.S. nor China will use cyber means for commercial espionage. Now, okay. that doesn't mean the end of espionage. Espionage is as old as human behavior. Yeah. But commercial espionage, meaning you're stealing intellectual property rights to unbalance a otherwise competitive market system, that they agreed not to do. Mm -hmm. So there isn't so in this gray zone below the below the level of the laws of armed conflict, uh, there are two examples. One with Russia, which is a failure, mm -hmm. one with China, which is a success. Mm -hmm. Though God knows what Trump is doing now. I mean that's <laughs> this is the world before Trump I'm mm -hmm. describing. <laughs> I'm sure there will be some questions about Trump, but yeah. so I'll quickly move on. Um, so what about the global level then? You said the GGE was a failure. Could you expand on that? Well, it's not, a, it's not a complete failure. I'll give a view and then Fani should... Uh, uh, the, the UN group of government experts, uh, which uh, had a quite good report in 2015, uh, but was unable to conclude on another report in 2017, 
uh, did develop some very interesting principles. And notice that it, unlike traditional arms control where you outlaw a weapon, you can't outlaw a cyber weapon because you don't know what a cyber weapon is. Mm. The same program could be used for, for good. damage or for, or for uh, uh, good. And uh, so what they did, what the states did, was say, we will outlaw not the weapon, but certain targets. Okay. And the targets are civilian targets. So it's like saying, in kinetic terms, we won't bomb hospitals. Yeah. Now we know Assad does bomb hospitals, but, but most states adhere to the Red Cross principles, you don't bomb hospitals. Yeah. And, and what the 2015 GGE report tried to do was to get the equivalent in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And it did, if you, and also not to interfere with the uh, certs, the, 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 any effort to try to understand what was happening, you didn't, you, you didn't try to break that or interfere with it. So I would argue that we had the beginnings of some quite significant pro progress toward norms under the UNGG. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has run into a roadblock in 2017, and now there's a big question of where do we go next? Some people think we'll develop a special committee under the first uh, committee of the UN General Assembly or something. But I, I, it's a big question what, what next at the global level. What, what's well, your I, I can I, follow you know? up right there because mm -hmm. we have been asking that question with the Secretary General specifically. Uh, and I think he will be announcing next week a little bit where he's heading in that direction. Uh, so don't quote me on this. He might be delayed by another week, but we're almost there. So the Secretary General came uh, and his team came to the conclusion, to answer your earlier question, that the way to solve many of these, for these norms, mm -hmm. is to find a way to get public, private, and civic interests together cooperate on creating these norms. Now that's a big, huge jump for New York, for the UN in New York. So to say that they're now looking past the member states of the UN to solve this issue is a big deal. And it's actually a huge credit for that goes to the Secretary General himself, who actually understands that the UN, which is essentially an intergovernmental state, uh, uh, let's say, form, is not sufficient to build these norms. And so he will be inviting a, a group of people uh, shortly uh, under his, uh, at least his convening his office, to start thinking about a new system for cooperation between public, private, and civic interests to set norms for the digital age. So that's what we're hearing uh, may come out. And, 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 and you know, whether it will be successful in shaping that or not, I don't know. I've been with Joe involved in several efforts to do precisely that before. But I must tell you, there's something different this time. It may be related to Joe's theory on the timing, that it's been 20 years or so. But I do think that most of the citizens that I talk to, my friends, my colleagues, people I address, are starting to really lose trust in the digital space. Okay. Now, that wasn't the case five, six years ago. Uh, so there's loss of trust in governments. Mm. There is loss of trust in businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean... Just think where Facebook was a year ago and where it is today, in terms of most of us saying, yeah, yeah, no problem, we trust Facebook, mm -hmm. right? And then there is a general loss of trust in all the systems that will help save us and secure us and govern us. So because of that, I think the moment has come to start setting a new system of norms mm -hmm. for the digital space. But it will have to be, I agree with the Secretary General, multi-stakeholder. Uh, and um, 
just to conclude on that point, where do I think the risk will be? Mm -hmm. The risk will be in governments not accepting that. Because governments are not used to give up control. <laughs> And they're pretty much right now being asked, you need to share control. Uh, that's the biggest risk. Uh, the one that is right behind it is companies saying, we're not going to give up control. I mean, why should Google give up control? Mm -hmm. They're in a pretty good place. <laughs> and they're, uh, they are growing. They have profits. They are responding well to their shareholders. Some of us are shareholders, so we're doing well because of that. Why would Google give up that massive control they have? I mean, all of us are focused on Facebook, but frankly, by my calculation, Google must have about 30 times more data on you than Facebook. Yeah. So, uh, you know, those companies have enormous control. They have also enormous opportunity to do good with their control. I just met the CEO of one of the largest companies, other than governments, that own satellites roaming our atmosphere. And I was so shocked when he told me, he says, we have so much power now because we have 100 small satellites roaming the Earth. We're tracking so much. I mean, and I mean so much. It's quite amazing that he says, I almost want to find a way to take my company off of the profitability track and find a way to make it entirely for the public good. That's the first time a CEO in Silicon Valley said something like this to me. But it is impressive that he is starting to feel this is so powerful. I have a responsibility to make sure this data that I have ends up being somehow for the public good, not for the shareholders' good. So moving from shareholders to stakeholders on some of these powerful capabilities is, I think, a key area we need to look at in the next Could case. I ask Fadi sure. a question? Sure. Uh, what I have a colleague who has proposed the following theory, hmm. which is right now cyber as a weapon is regarded as relatively benign. In other words, if you say cyber war, you think of click, click, and you know one system gets down or another system gets down. But as Solmeyer says, nobody's been killed. Yeah. What happens when a lot of people are killed? Will there be a revulsion which will change that? And if you say, well, what would be the causes of that? It's the IoT, the Internet of Things. Yes. Instead of just where we are now, when you have your trillion connections and you can manipulate them so that not just one driverless car makes a choice between an old lady and, and a baby uh, deciding which way to steer, but suppose somebody is able to get into a thousand cars and make sure they all crash at the same time in the same city, in the same place, correct, or something like that. Will that develop the moral revulsion so that cyber is no longer seen as a relatively benign weapon, but as quite horrible, and that it'll be a little bit like chemicals in World War I? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that theory is that we're on the threshold of a revulsion which would lead to this internalization of a norm. Other people say, nonsense, uh, humans will just adjust. And what's your reaction? So I hope all of you will sleep well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to uh, build for a moment on what, because uh, I, you know, I was a student of artificial intelligence in the mid-'80s when you know, very few of us, and my professors told me, abandon this because you'll never make money on AI. So uh, now it's all about AI. But just to tell you, there are, why was AI useless then and it's not now? It's because of what Joe was just describing. So I want to make sure you see the picture. The, the, the Internet enables machines and things to talk to each other. That's what it does. 
it exchanges data between entities. Now, that was okay when we had 5 million, 10 million, 30 billion. When you have 100 trillion things that talk to each other, that's not the problem. That's okay. Where the problem starts arising is when machines are seeing all of these connections and able to tap into them and then able to do things. I mean, right now there are heart monitors that talk to the internet because, of course, your doctor tells you if you use this model, you know, I'll be able on my phone to know when your heart is going too fast and I'll give you a call or my office will give you a call. So you say, oh, great service. I'll do it. Everything will be connected, and now machines will be actually collecting that data. And so far, I'm okay. I'm still not worried. Where I get worried is that machines now will be able to do things. They will be making decisions, maybe to turn off your heart valve for whatever reason. You're costing the insurance company too much, something. I mean, so machines start making actionable decisions. We're not far from that. I mean, this morning in the cover of the FT, you know, with DeepMind and the, the commission saying, stop giving DeepMind data from NHS. I mean, th this is happening as we speak, that machines will start making decisions. So that's the world we're getting into, <laughs> right? Where uh, everything's connected, the data's being collected, and I saw it. I was in Glasgow yesterday looking at another company that was literally showing me from their satellites every moving vessel in the planet in real time. And then he says, do you want to see just leisure vessels? I said, yes. He clicked one button. Half the picture disappeared. Can I look at this vessel? Yeah, this is vessel so-and-so. It's owned by so-and-so, and it's heading wherever. It's remarkable how much data is now being collected by little companies you've never heard of. And, of course, they need to make money. So if somebody shows up says, here's a million dollars, give me the data, they'll sell it. I ask the CEO, would you give this data to anybody who comes to your door? Oh, no, no, we'll make the right decisions. Okay. So now to Joe's question, though, just to close on that, Joe's asking me, now that this is the picture, you asked, is this going to change a, and create a moral revulsion? By all of us, yeah. that would create some kind of revolution that allows us to take control again. My, uh, uh, just I want to remind us, we are the 0.01% of humanity that understands what we just went through. There's billions of people who have no clue about what we're talking about. So revulsion that would stop this use will require broad-based understanding of how we're being used today. I used the term in a, or, in a meeting or of data slavery. Or 100,000 car crashes engineered by St. Petersburg. Yeah, mm -hmm. or by a bad person, not St. Petersburg. So this is a bad guy, mm -hmm. you know, in in, I don't know, in Cairo, sitting behind a computer, who figured it out, that you and I will never find out. This is why, unlike the nuclear non, uh, 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 discussion, where you had states that owned the nuclear power, now a kid. Mm. I mean, we found out that the kid that stopped the WannaCry virus was a kid mm. here in London, mm. <laughs> who yeah. sat down. He now is being accused of having started it as well. So, you know, so... Yes. You, Right? So that's why it is so. So the answer to you is it will take massive global awareness of the issue. And today, we don't have that awareness. What uh, Cambridge Analytica did, which I described sitting here two and a half years ago, and nobody knew what we're talking about, has been done to U.S. consumers and supermarkets for the last 30 years. Every time you go to a supermarket, people are tracking you. I even know the company that does this in Salem, uh, in North Carolina. They track you. They know exactly what you're buying. The coupons you get at home, it's because of what you bought last month. This has been happening for 25 years. Nobody cared. But now some company uses it for political reasons. We're all, whoa. But I think you need to be aware that what Joe's saying is now exponential. 
You know, 20 years ago, they tracked that you bought, uh, you know, uh, honey or whatever, and they tracked you. Now they know everything about you, your movements, your illnesses, your th what you are writing, your thoughts, your, your private discussions with your spouse, with your partner. Everything is out there because we're using the tools they give us to do that. So very difficult answer. So, and I don't know what it will take. At that point, um, I'm going to open it to the audience. Um, when you ask a question, if you could just tell us your name and what you do. Um, and is there a microphone? Yeah. yeah. This gentleman here? The gen Oh, here. Paul Anirban Paul from Continuing Education. And I want to combine the points of norms as well as non-state actors with the analytical framework of the old um, offense-defense dilemma. That is, so if you assume an offensive strike or vehicle or a tank, $400,000 being countered by an IED of 20, clearly the defender has the advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can, on the cyber side, it would seem the opposite, that the defense structure and the superstructure and manpower needed to counter is far more than the cost of producing a weapon. Mm -hmm. Given that advantage from the perspective of a power like, say, a former superpower in Europe, why wouldn't they sponsor non-state actors, which they already have, sign the treaty and not claim any connection with such actors over and beyond the criminal element? And so the part B becomes almost certainly you would still need after the day after the treaty an enforcement mechanism and what would that be? Well, the, the problem of attribution uh, is difficult to have attribution that would meet the test of court of law beyond reasonable doubt. But if you ask to what extent could GCHQ or the NSA tell you who had been behind this, if it was a state proxy, which is an, another state using a non, it's pretty very, it's very high probability. And if it does severe damage, they're not going to wait for court of law. The American military doctrine on this officially is that we will use any response in proportion to the damage that's done. So it's not the means by which the damage is done, but anything that has a severe damage, we will respond proportionately. Uh, and we're not going to wait until we take this to the ICC or the ICJ. And frankly, the, the ability to do enough attribution that you could say to, suppose it is the IRA in St. Petersburg, uh, or suppose it's another group that, uh, that it's bodies person in Cairo, but suppose that, that that person in Cairo is actually supported by a state, that would very likely be discovered. I mean, the connection would be like. Sometimes and, it takes a little bit of time, but they do discover it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here and over there. Aaron? Nadal? Hello? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned that in the United States, um, given the First Amendment, there is less intervention in public in private companies. Um, and just a few weeks ago, the United States courts ruled on the Knight case um, the, for the First Amendment in the United States that um, Twitter is a public space and therefore Trump cannot um, block users. I think that was the court. Um, do you see that as sort of a shift in policy within the United States or within other countries as well with governments increasingly being more, um, intervening more in the private space and in cyber security matters within companies. Okay, and we'll just take one more question at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Adi and, and Joe. Yesterday, Philip Pettit, the philosopher, gave a lecture here um, on HLA Hart's definitions of norms and primary rules. And, and one of the things he was talking about is how 
you have the definition of prudence and uh, that you mentioned, Joe, and internalization. But norms also need to be ratified by a group of people. There has to be a common consensus that the group believes that this is indeed a norm. And there has to be commitment, right? There, a commitment in the sense that you don't then go and make excuses and say, oh, I forgot to do X or to do Y, but you actually believe that, that those things are not rational defenses for going against a particular norm. Given that definition, I'm just wondering, can we even use the word norm here? I mean, both of you express reservations about whether there are even norms on cybersecurity, right? Um, because we don't have the moral revulsion that Joe mentioned, and there isn't a, there's a huge lack of consensus here. And given that countries have such a range of lived realities and practices, I'm wondering if the term even makes sense for us. It, it, there is at most emerging practice rather than norms on cyber. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay. Which question do you want to tackle first? Uh, well, on the, on the Nike case, which is quite interesting, the companies like Twitter, Facebook, Google have wanted to pretend that they were just pipes or just conduits. I mean, they're not editors. They weren't con the, the content was somebody else's problem. And uh, as we've seen in the aftermath, particularly of the 2016 election, that's not working. And so you've, you've had Zuckerberg hauled before the U.S. Congress and the Europeans, I mean, pushing and saying, you've got to be more responsible in that. And the company has made major changes. What's particularly interesting in the Twitter case um, is Twitter is a little bit different from Facebook. Facebook, you have to have, you're supposed to have real identification. Twitter, there isn't. There's an estimate that two-thirds of tweets are done by bots, and, but it returns revenue to Twitter. And so the question of whether Twitter should be treated as a public space subject to regulation is a, different, a little bit different from the, the case of Facebook, where at least there are efforts to identify and, and apply rules of agreements, uh, terms of agreement. Uh, the Knight case is interesting um, because some American civil liberties lawyers say our first thought as liberals was this is a good thing. Our second thought ought to be if the government gets into that, if it is a public space, then we're going to be tied down by First Amendment concerns and we'll actually have less responsible behavior, not more responsible behavior. So it's a kind of a paradox for civil libertarians. And the question there that was about norms, are we talking about norms here? Well, Aaron, 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 Aaron's point. Yes. Yeah, I, what's interesting here is I think there are norms. We, you know, there are different degrees of norms. I also heard the, the Pettit lecture, which was, which was very interesting. Uh, I think norms can actually develop from prudence. I, so he talked about internalization, but he never quite described the process of internalization. And he was using uh, a, a basically a small number of actors rather than nation states. But for example, uh, Tom Schelling, the Nobel Prize winner, said the most important norm in the world is the nuclear taboo, and which is held for 70 years. But that developed out of prudence. In the early days, uh, the military developed nuclear weapons, the Honest John, it was called, small enough to be on the back of a soldier. And in the early days, it was regarded that nuclear weapons would be used. Eisenhower and others said, you know, I'm going to thread, but I'm not going to actually use these things, out of prudence. If you have a pattern of prudence long enough, prudence being the first step in, in Pettit's uh, hierarchy, that becomes a norm. And what's interesting is if from the 1950s, when Eisenhower refused to use these things in the Taiwan uh, Straits crisis or Dien Bien Phu crisis, uh, to it took about 30 years before you ever had that ratified in Pettit's terms. The ratification was when Gorbachev and Reagan 
issued a joint statement, nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. But, the, but in between, you had the development of a taboo, which was very powerful. And, and according to Schelling, I think it's right, the most important norm that's developed, but purely informal. So again, time horizons are interesting here. The question that one, if one wants to be slightly uh, 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 puzzling, is would Kim Jong-un be bound by that norm? The nuclear taboo. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. He killed his uncle and his brother. Yeah. There are other norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of questions. We'll take them two at a time. The gentleman in blue and the lady here. Yeah, go. And one question each. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, Professor Knight, I thought it was um, really interesting what you said that arms control is not very likely in the context of weaponizing information. Um, maybe because Russia's elections don't, aren't as important, I think, is what you said. So um, the reason I found that intuitive, and please correct me if my understanding is wrong, is because my understanding is that Russia has been suggesting an information kind of security treaty since 1998, kind of consistently for a decade every single year, um, and that the U.S., among other states, but primarily the U.S., was resisting this. Um, because the fear was that this would turn into a threat to freedom of speech and people's access to information and wanted to keep the UNGG process to be about informational architectures rather than information content. Mm. So um, kind of in light of the US becoming a victim of various different information weapons last year in the elections, um, my question would be, is that kind of a treaty, the kind of treaty that would look at interference and content and communication across borders, is that more feasible? And, and do you think that would be desirable? Well, okay, I'll take one more. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, following up on your um, Fadi's uh, um, proposal or discussion that the UN is moving towards proposing something in that domain. Um, so what would be, based on your experience in ICANN, in the multi-stakeholder model that ICANN functions within, uh, which is very inclusive. I am used to be an ICANN fellow. I'm a fan of the model. However, it's very or less efficient, if you like, because of its inclusivity from other top-down models, if you like, or agreements on these kind of domains. So in this case of governing cyberspace, which one, which of the following models would be more realistic or acceptable, one that is taking into this multi-stakeholder model, uh, yeah. including the, uh, the governments, but also the civil societies, as well as the businesses, yeah. etc., or something that is based on uh, a neutral, quote-unquote, algorithm of AI that everybody can audit and can deliver on and govern that, uh, which might be more effective or more efficient, but less maybe corruptible. corruptible. Which w and and <laughs> maybe also Joe's view on this: well, what would be the which one would be a more preferable one? Why don't you go? Look, we learned a lot from the ICANN experiment, but um, and ICANN does some things very well. ICANN being again the institution still managing that top of the table, it's managing. It, something small but very critical, which is how do we identify uniquely everything connected to the internet? Big deal. Uh, and until the U.S. government stepped back, we were in danger of China and other countries starting a whole new internet. So it was a big deal. But it's now at least settled. The way we make decisions at ICANN, now that the U.S. government stepped away, is by having governments businesses, civil society, get together in groups and come up with policies regarding the stable. So for example, when we added to the root something like dot, uh, dot .islam as a new domain name, okay, who gets to control dot .islam? Dot .catholic was easy because we gave it to the Pope, which <laughs> we, we actually did. Uh, but dot .islam, who gets it? It's very complicated, right? And who will decide? 
whatever dot Islam goes to whom and so on. So there are policy groups that get together and decide that because it's delicate and it's important. Now, can we take this model and apply it to uh, issues on the table? I believe we can. The only question that we're trying to resolve also through this new, uh, hopefully to be announced shortly, uh, commission by the UN Secretary General is where do, so ICANN is an institution. It's a well-known institution and they organize things. Now, do we need to create a new institution to deal with the things above the table? Do we use institutions like this, like Oxford, that supposedly is trusted? Uh, how do we do that? Uh, so we're now getting into the details of the structure of a new system. Uh, and you have people like Vince Cerf, my, my friend and a colleague, who would say, no new institutions. The last thing we need is new institutions. Don't create any new things. We have enough institutions, right? And of course, if you create a new institution, who's controlling that institution? And then we get into that fight. So I'm a proponent of something I've written about called the polycentric cooperation system. That is a system that uh, has g a general set of principles but is highly distributed, almost like the internet. So I contend that we should create a cooperation and governance model for the cyberspace that looks like the internet, which means it's highly distributed, but somehow it is coordinated. Now, maybe a machine will coordinate it. Maybe an institution will coordinate it. We're actually discussing both models. But that's uh, at a high level without getting into a lot of detail. That's another lecture for another day, kind of how we're thinking through learning from ICANN and setting a new model for the future. And did we take the lady's question? OK, let me, let me just quickly answer yes, Fadi's yes. answer to Fadi. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Fadi uh, Salem as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, we should not forget that there are a lot of areas on top of the table where there are normative structures. Crime, uh, you know, the Budapest Convention, or if you take uh, some agreements such as the U.S.-China agreement on commercial, uh, cyber commercial espionage, that was taken to the G20 and endorsed at the G20. So there, there are a number of areas where uh, you're getting these little islands of, of norms. And so the idea that this is all the big Wild West and there's no norms at all is simply not the case. I wrote an article a couple of years ago called The Regime Complex for Cyber Activity. And what that says is rather than a single regime, and this brings me to your question, we have one UN treaty which solves everything. That's never going to be verifiable. It's never going to work. It can't keep up with the volatility of the right. technology. So if you go instead to Fadi's idea of thinking of a series of normative islands, if you want, mm -hmm. and then you have to ask, how do you pull them together? And uh, Wolfgang Kleinwacher, who uh, has studied this sometime, has said, why don't we use the analogy of the Helsinki process during the Cold War, where you had different areas of negotiation, they called them baskets, but in the same context. And so what he's suggesting is that you might have a, uh, a conference on security and stability in cyberspace which might be attached to the uh, uh, to something like the uh, you can attach it any any place. But the point is that you'd have a set of separate negotiations, but there'd be loose coordination among them. And I think that's getting at the type of thing that Fadi said. That brings me back to the the, the Russian uh, treaty uh, was never real. I mean, they they came in. They were worried about the Americans having advantage. What they said is, how can we stop the Americans and slow them down? But it was never verifiable. And it was, it was you know, if, if we had signed on the dotted line, it wouldn't have stopped the Russian interference in the 2016 election. So, I mean, that's, if, you, if you wanted to think of an analog, what you could imagine uh, is going to the Russians and saying, you're using information warfare. You think that what we do when we 
use the National Endowment for Democracy and Information Warfare. Let's have an agreement that we limit how we do this or how much of it we do. And then the question is, uh, is that really sustainable or not? The, the, in the Cold War, we reached a set of agreements, even though we were deeply divided on values, but they were related to blowing up the world. The question is, is there enough commonality now to imagine an agreement where for information warfare, which is what this is, in the cyber realm, um, the, you could get a detente. It might be more likely that you could get an informal agreement uh, to sort of knock it off. There's a, there, there, there's a, in espionage, you know, real life espionage, even during the Cold War, the Russians and the West didn't kill each other's spies. They killed their own, as we've seen, or try to kill them uh, with the Skripal case. But, the, but they, you, you, you captured the, uh, this other spy and you returned it in exchange. But there was, ironically, a norm uh, in espionage that, okay, you capture and exchange, you don't kill the other side's spies. Uh, could you imagine an analogous situation with interference in information warfare, where you say, I know you're going to do some of it, but let's keep it within certain limits. Very hard to think of Very how you'd hard. write this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we had a handful of questions. I'll take those to the, uh, sorry, the gentleman there and the lady there. Shaf, I walked in off the street about 70 minutes ago and haven't given this a thought. Um, I want to know how disruptive this could be, because it seems to me what you've been talking about is that corporations are going to act in the public interest. Nation states are being bypassed. I just wonder, is there a future of the nation state? In the hockey stick that you've described, where does the nation state actually become irrelevant? Irrelevant, you said? Irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. The lady there. Hi there. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm from uh, MIT, where I do work on AI policy. And I'm curious, uh, related to the other Fadi's question about the panel on digital cooperation, um, and sort of related to this question around the new distribution of power in digital space, who you consider to be sort of, or what key risks the panel ought to consider, and who might be key spoilers to it achieving its mandate. Thank you. One more there, gentlemen there. Thank you. So um, thinking on the example of how we've tried to manage the financial sector, could we uh, see in the future instances of uh, third party verifications that are very intrusive into firms? Let's say, could we see forms of uh, citizen or government ombuds ombudsmen within companies in, in Silicon Valley? Or could we see governments moving forward in sort of supporting um, the disclosure from employers? Uh, or employees on malpractices from the firms, uh, as we see in the financial sector, and I think we ha we don't really see that in, in telecom or uh, digital yeah. governance area. Could, are we seeing this sort of trend? There is there is an analogy to that to that last point in finance. There is a, a, a rule: know your customer, and companies, financial companies, banks. That, uh, that hide behind anonymity and say, oh, I didn't know this was a criminal gang that uh, financed this. The rule, know your customer, means that you can be liable and a government can essentially punish you. Indeed, they have punished for that, for not knowing your customer. Uh, and so one of the interesting analogs is can you imagine the government, governments passing laws that say to Facebook and Google and others, if you don't know your customer, if you don't exercise some authority as not an editor, but as a monitor, if you want, yeah. uh, you can be liable. And that gets to the point about the role of governments. It's a big mistake to think governments are finished. Governments have. Uh, they have far more resources in terms of uh, uh, coercive power. You, put, you can throw people in jail, and even in financial power. 
you could say, well, Google was stronger or Facebook is stronger than, uh, than Britain or the government of Britain. Uh, well, you know what? When the GDPR was passed and there was a prospect of Google being fined by, uh, you know, 4% of global profits and so forth, that got their attention. And to go back to Fadi's analogy, all those wires down below all the 70,000 networks are connected to servers which are within the sovereign territory of one or another state. And when you ask what happens when a executive of one of these all-powerful multinational corporations sets foot in the company or in a country where one of these servers is located, he or she can be thrown in jail, coercive power of the state, and that is real. Yeah. And so, so the I mean, so don't think that the state is finished. What we're seeing, if anything, is increased efforts of states to in, intrude with sovereignty into the cyber world, and they've been doing it quite successfully. If you look at at uh, at the trend, it's not been the libertarian cyber world that we all sang about in the 1990s. Even John Perry Barlow, yeah. 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 It's essentially, the trend has been exactly in the opposite, the opposite direction. direction. Yeah, it's difficult to add much to what Joe said. Uh, so I think he did address your question about the, the nation state, but the nation state also needs to rethink its role. Um, uh, because it has to share power. But how does it then use its power for the good of its citizens, hopefully in most cases, is something to be rethought right now. But as to your question, I thought you had something very important in your statement. Will companies use, like in the financial sector, some oversight bodies and so on? And, you know, you, Google had an ethics body independent. They dismantled it, right? Uh, we're hoping they reset it because the rules around it were not clear. But I think that will be a great way forward for companies. Uh, today we met with a Google person who openly said, I mean, we're still naive. We still don't know a lot of the answers. We were impressed he did. Uh, but he's right. I mean, those companies are learning. By the way, notice the subtle but very important difference between what a company like Facebook or Google or Twitter, Silicon Valley type companies speak when they s talk about their responsibility versus a company like Microsoft or AT&T. Very different. I mean, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, declared we need the Geneva Convention to protect citizens in the cyber world. Of course, everybody in Silicon Valley attacked him. He said, Brad, you lost your mind. What are you talking about? So there's a, a sense of maturity starting to happen in companies. And the question is, do we wait till Google matures, or do we force it to mature? That's a different question. But you're spot on. In the financial sector, we have come up with ways for self-policing and uh, increasing the maturity of companies. Sarah, to your, the risk we have, you ask what risks are we considering as we do all of this. I think we talked all day about the risks. The concern we have, uh, which we will be addressing, is to get the businesses on board. Because I think nation states are feeling that China and the United States have, be have started a massive race in the AI world in different ways. The U.S. and China are approaching it very differently, but they're both on a race. Because if you remember earlier, I was speaking about AI as the top player. Now the machines up there managing a lot of these things. They both are racing to control that layer, right? So nation states see that. They're not oblivious to it, and they can't compete. They can't compete with, with the, not even Europe is now in a position to catch up with them. So the question will become, Nation states, will they cooperate with a new system? I generally think so. It's businesses. Will they all be at the table and willing to sit down in a new system of cooperation? Because today, Mr. Facebook 
can make any decision he wants. It's his call, really, at the end of the day. So long as he's providing profits to his shareholders, he's fine. Will he be willing to now agree to protocols co-designed with the public sector and the civic sector? That's the risk we face. Okay. And one more round of questions here. And this is quite tough. There at the back. Uh, yes, if you start. Yeah. Uh, hi, Fadi and Joe. My name's Toby. I work here at the school uh, on a program looking at technology and development. Um, I want to push back on, on, I guess, the, the thread of this conversation because you started by saying that there's no such thing as cyber, everything's cyber. So I wonder, don't, don't we already have a lot of norms that would protect from cyber attack? Um, crashing a thousand cars, you know, there's, there's norms against attacking civilians. So, so don't sort of the rules of war and anti-terrorism norms already protect, uh, protect us from a lot of these harms? And if so, like what, what harms are left? What are the harms to people that really need to be protected and I just very briefly want to put forward a hypothesis for you to shoot down uh, and that is that it, the world's taking a bit of a almost a Marxist turn right where the the harms are sort of these economic and social harms where there's the data producers all of us and then there's the very small class that profit from data and that seems to be the the main harm that is completely different to, to anything that we've got really robust norms for already and so how do we protect against that if that is indeed the harm that remains um, I'm a marketeer I studied here last year I was working on diplomacy and my I would like to start with my question and then go for uh, with my rational so um, why should I not uh, give away my data why not give away thinking about um, how the, uh, the world started our formation as a society. I'm sure Paul Collier would speak much better than me. Um, but we started with the anarchy and all the government there or the kingdoms used to get information to get money back to their society and make it stronger and keep the economy of violence on that to keep it even more stronger. If you see the formation of the internet, how it started, and the Cold War also had like similar goal to keep the power. But then we see also another layer of society and how the psychology of that and the society to behave on that. So we saw the trade coming and how we used to collect information when you're trading in the cities, for example. How we, uh, the, the way we speak, the way we dress ourselves is also data. And then in the internet, we have the dark trade. We had um, cyber attacks, for example, the US uh, with the, in the era, sorry, um, with the stats next, for example, when it, uh, we couldn't get back with the Article 51, for example. And then the companies using data to promote, uh, to get, to promote innovation, to understand the communities and get new product. So the thing is that it's just an extension of our society. So why Basel norms and things that is an extension in, um, in why Basel norms in data instead seeing internet, the internet and the cyberspace as an extension? So should we need a social contract? And the thing is, who is going to make the social contract? Okay. Right. Who would like to take that? Well, why don't you take the data one and I'll take the sure. uh, norms one. So you can have to. So you're, you, you, made, you painted a picture of how data has been exchanged. And you, your final central question was, why should we not give that data? You should give that data if you choose to. That's it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, here, or I don't think many of us are in, in the position of telling you, don't give the data to these bad guys. No, we're just saying, it's your data. If you want to donate it to Facebook, by all means, maybe you'll donate it to Facebook and buy some shares in Facebook. Maybe, but you have to make that decision. That's what I'm contending, that humans are producing now 
information by using everything. And soon, simply by wearing a set of glasses, by putting a certain device in your body, you're beaming information all the time. You walk, you're beaming information. You decide to go into a store, you're sending information. That information, uh, I contend, we should debate this, is really the ownership of the person producing it. Uh, the question is, if companies or countries wish to access it for a reason, I should at least know. Just have the knowledge of that. And then I should decide how to barter it. Maybe I'll say, I'm OK with you having it. Many people give their medical information gladly if it helps research. But they should know. You, you heard the case in the US now of, of this one person who's been, the professors at UCLA were even telling him to come down because we need to take care of you. The man was flying on his own expense for years up and down to downtown to Los Angeles to UCLA. They were doing tests on him. It turns out they were doing research on him, and that research led to creation of a multi-billion dollar drug. He didn't even know all these years. So that's the question, right? It's, we give data. We contribute data to the system. How do we make sure it is transparent to us who's using it, for what, and we should decide if this is a giveaway or this is something we want to barter for something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the, on, uh, your insight is correct. There are lots of norms related to cyber because, as Fadi said, cyber is part of everything. And so uh, you have uh, criminal acts, uh, which are criminal in normal life, they're criminal online. Made a simple version of this is uh, uh, child pornography, yeah. and and it's one of the rare areas where you have it transnationally pretty universally agreed, and on a certain number of crimes there is a fair degree of cooperation through Interpol. Uh, so, there, and I said earlier that at the level of interstate behavior at the law of armed conflict, the UN Charter governs as do the Geneva Conventions. So, so your statement is correct. The interesting puzzle is what new norms do I need because of this technology? Is there anything new? And let me give you an example. The norm of liability yeah. ought to be changed, in my view, as we enter the Internet of Things era, or we're already in it. But, for example, the norm in the past has been for the industry, and, it's, and there's actually a law that created this, uh, is move fast, break things, patch later. And, that, and that's been the norm because it was regarded as encouraging innovation which produced vast social benefits. And the problem with that is when you're in the trillions of devices uh, if you wind up with no liability changes, if you keep the old norm which encouraged innovation in software, what do you do if you buy a smart refrigerator and it turns out that the industrial control in it, a chip which is, uh, or SCADA chip or something which is uh, uh, programmed to last for 15 years, if it goes haywire or it's hacked into, should you be able to turn it off? And if not, suppose it does damage to you or your, your house. Uh, who is liable? And if I'm a company and I'm going to put in a chip that for $2 and uh, it has no security, and my comp and I, but I could put in a chip for $20, which would be Absolutely. reprogrammable. So that if something went wrong with it, I, the consumer, could do something. With it. And I'm in a competitive race. I'm going to put in the $2 chip, and the consumer is going to be stuck with that. We ought to have rules which relate to a different liability system as we enter into the Internet of Things era. Uh, we should be able to turn off these smart devices and turn them back to analog. You know, we, we should be able to say, Alexa, shut up. 
And, you know, it, it, it's the and, title of the next paper by John. <laughs> Alexa, shut up. I like it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the point is that, that, that those are norms and laws we need as because of technological change. Yes. But we do have huge numbers of, of norms and laws that govern yep. cyber activity and, now. And on that point of liability, think uh, one level past the chip to now a machine decided that this chip is going haywire or whatever in your house, and the machine makes a decision to do something to your fridge. And let's say that thing causes a lot of damage to you. Who's liable? The person who wrote the software and made a mistake? Was this crowdsourced? I mean, when machines start making decisions, I was with the, the head of a big insurance company who was telling me she, they don't even know how insurance will work when machines are making decisions. Who's liable now when the car decided to hit the lady with a baby as opposed to the old person? Who's liable? How do you go after that? Very complicated. That's, these are all the new norms we need to think of. Uh, and some of them will be existing bodies that can do it. Some of them will need new networks of experts to do. And some of them may be repurposed norms that are adjusted for the new digital age. We have lots of work ahead. We do indeed. And I think we've come to a close um, on this topic of norms to promote stability and avoid conflict in cyberspace. Um, but the conversation here will continue. Here at the Blavatnik School, we are very much interested in the intersection of public policy and technology, and we're on from here. So um, some of you have taken a module in cybersecurity, and I'm sure we would love to continue this conversation. It's been an absolute privilege um, speaking to you both. So please join me in thanking both of you. And thank you for good moderation. <laughs> thank you, Zach. Appreciate it.